Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Seacat. And my name is Donna Conwell, and we are your hosts of Scratch Space. Scratch Space is a virtual forum hosted by the Lucas Artist Residency Program at the Montalvo Art Center, which is located in Saratoga, California, on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone people. With Scratch Space, we're bringing together visual artists, scholars, composers, activists, writers, and others to explore what kind of radical imaginaries can unfold in this moment of pandemic, racial reckoning, economic uncertainty, civil unrest, and environmental crisis. We're interested in how do we think about what is possible? How can we use our imaginations to build a better present and future? And how can we retool and create better and more equitable models for living and working together? So tell us about our guest today, Kelly. Wow, I'm excited about our conversation today, Donna. You and I'll step away and let the brilliance sort of unfold. So we're joined today from Italy um, by our dear friend and former Lucas Artist Fellow, Zane Jukadar, an LAP literary fellow who is an award-winning author of the novel, The 30 Names of Night as well as the map of salt and stars. His work appeared in Salon, the Paris Review, Shonda, Shondaland, Mizna, Kink Stories, and elsewhere. He's been nominated for a Pushcart Prize, currently a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award in Transgender Fiction. Mm. Uh, the winners will be announced June 1st and was awarded the 2021 Barbara Gidding Stonewall Book Award for the 30 Names of Night. He's a Piriplex Collective mentor and guest editor of the 2020 Queer and Trans Voices Issues of Mizna. We're also joined from Fez, Morocco, by our dear friend, colleague, and the former manager of the Lucas Artist Programs, Lori Wood. Lori is a writer and the founder and director of the Fez Medina Project, an international artist residency and social venture project in the medieval Medina of Fez, Morocco. Lori's worked in the field of artist residency programs for 30 years. She directed the Villa Montalvo Artist Residency Program from 1991 to 95. Pri prior to the construction of the new Lucas Artist Residency Program, she was an advisor to me for many of my first years in my role as director, and she joined our team from 2015 until we closed due to COVID in 2020 as the manager of our program. And we're delighted to have her here today. Well, I'm really excited for this conversation and to spend some time with Zane and Laurie. Um, we want to thank Nathan Zanon, our producer behind the scenes, and Eric, who will be providing live captioning for this event. To access live captioning, please press the button that says CC on the bottom of your screen. We're going to do things a little differently today. We are now going to invite Zane and Laurie to join us uh, for just a five minute chat to catch up on where they are and what they're up to these days. And then we will disappear and leave Laurie and Zane to chat for about 40 minutes. We'll return for the last 10 minutes to field questions from you, our audience. So please post your questions and comments in the chat. Hello. Jane and Laurie. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Welcome to Scratch Space. Thanks for having us. Well, it's a treat to have you here. Zane, you have been so busy. It's been an absolute joy to watch not only all of your work, but all of your advocacy over the last year and just your voice and your presence has been absolutely, you know, it's been incredible and a real asset to all of us. So thank you for your work. Lori Wood, we miss you. I We're miss you. Happy to have you here. <laughs> and here I just you. wanted you to take a moment to, to tell us about the Fez Medina project and what you're doing um, at this time, because we all need to kind of have these little seeds to hang on to, to know where you are. Well, I, uh, we founded the Fez Medina Project 20 years ago. It's actually our 20th anniversary. And um, 
we did this for a family social enterprise, uh, myself and my Moroccan family. Um, and over the years, we have run periodic artist residencies. Most of our artists have actually been Arab writers. Um, and I thought that was a good way to begin. Um, and we haven't been able to do full-time residencies at this point. I don't think it will ever be a full-time residency, but we're trying to design a way that, to do a periodic ongoing residency here. And it gives artists the chance to live in the completely remarkable old Medina of Fez, which is you know, just an extraordinary place. And, uh, and to feel at home in old traditional houses and to, to experience living in a house uh, in a traditional way. That's great. And Zane, you've spent time at the residency in the Fez Medina, right? Yeah, I was going to hop in and say, um, I, I, th I think I was like one of the early um, or maybe just recent um, uh, artists in residence and, and I was there for a couple of months and I remember like how formative it was for me because I was working on revising this book uh, 30 Names of Night while I was there um, and it was like it was a place where I and this is this is now several years ago it was the place that I kind of first like uh, made the decision to to come out as trans so it was like a really um, I don't know I just think there's something like very magical about the I mean about the Medina in general but even just like the house um, which is, it's wild to me that like, you're sitting, like, Lori, you're sitting at the table where I was working on this book. And I was like, ah, oh, I miss it. Actually, it's like, it'll always have a place in my heart. <laughs> well, you know, you're, the, the spirit of you walks in the house and say, I, I think a lot about you here. And um, as, and I was reading, as I was reading your work, um, you know, just knowing that, that you were in this house during so much of the process of becoming that you've been going through these last years it's it's uh makes me deeply happy to know no it was a gift that place it's still a gift so we appreciate both of you and we appreciate you being with us today donna and i are going to step away we're going to let the two of you talk about the 30 names of night i remember when laurie was reading an early manuscript for you zane at the residency and um we're going to come back and join you in about 40 minutes or so. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. So Zane, now it's just the two of us. It's awesome. so fun to be able to talk to you. I know, I'm so psyched about this. Um, I mean, we've had so many conversations about this book anyway, like over the years, so. It is, it's, it's like an ongoing conversation and we just jump into it. We'll just pretend we're at artist dinner at the LAP around that big table and if the many only. conversations that we've had. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I told you yesterday when we talked that I got a chance to reread this book. I made sure that I reread it again right before this conversation so that it was fresh and so that I'm living in it. And uh, it, it's just so beautiful. There's so many moments in this book where my hair just stood up on end. That, that you just, you wrote something so beautiful that it was just a, a heart stopping moment. And uh, it Thank was you. so beautiful to see it in, it in its final form also, having seen it in an earlier form and to just, to see really your mastery at, at, at carrying a story along and to see the new things that you did and uh, I think of the story almost as a big Persian miniature painting, you know, with birds everywhere and, and different storylines weaving through it. And it's so brilliant. And, every, and, and through all these scenes, you have birds flying through. Uh, and they, they come through as messengers. They come through to draw the plot along. They come through to surprise and to remind. And they're also reminders of beauty. And uh, they, they play so many roles in the book. Um, there's so many things to say about that. And one of the things that I, as I was reading your beautiful acknowledgements, I, it was so beautiful the way you begin for this journey, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and this is a book about a journey. And uh, well, it, this is a book about journeys, really. There's so many journeys and so many storylines that are so beautifully braided and woven. And um, I hoped that we might start perhaps by you reading us the first moments of the book so that we can start with your voice and allow people to just step into the poetry of the work and to feel it. 
Yeah, I would love to. Um, and uh, the one thing that I'll say before I begin, because it's hard to, uh, for folks that haven't read it, it's hard to like um, convey this uh, like by voice, but I'll show what, what the page actually looks like because there's a, an important visual aspect to it that I'm sure we can talk about later. But um, on the very first page of the first chapter, you'll notice that the name of the narrator is scribbled out. Um, and I actually did all of the scribbles by hand. My publisher managed to um, incorporate them into the book. They're not just um, for the name of the narrator, the contemporary narrator, at least. They're, they're also, they occur throughout in other moments where there's moments where the characters actually take control of, let's say, the information that they want the reader to know um, and like uh, use um, this sort of like censoring as, as a form of like a counter erasure, a, a kind of resistance that they, um, that they're doing. So um, to start out, we're dealing with an unnamed narrator who has scribbled out his own name. Okay, one. Tonight, five years to the day since I lost you, 48 white-throated sparrows fall from the sky. Tomorrow, the papers will count and photograph them, arrange them on black garbage bags and, se and speculate on the causes of the blight. But for now, here on the roof of Tita's apartment building, the sheen of evening rain on the tar paper slicks the soles of my sneakers and velvet arrows drop one by one from the autumn migration sweeping over Borum Hill. The sparrows thud onto the houses around me, old three and four story brownstones, generation homes with sculpted stoops, a handful recently bought from the families who have owned them for decades and gutted for resale. Nothing has stayed the way it was since you died, not even the way we grieve you. Downstairs in Tita's apartment, I've drawn the curtains, tucked Tita's glasses back into their drawer so that even if she wakes, she won't look down on this street dashed with dying birds. Five years ago, when your absence stitched her mouth shut for weeks, I hid your collection of feathers, hid the preserved shells of robin's eggs, hid the specimens of bone. Each egg was its own shade of blue. I slipped them into a shoebox under my bed. When you were alive, the warmth of each shell held the thrill of possibility. I first learned to mix paint by matching the smooth turquoise of a heron's egg, first aqua, then celadon, then cooling the warmth of cadmium yellow with phthalo blue. And when you died, Teta quoted Athar, the self has passed away in the beloved. Tonight, the sparrow's feathers are brush strokes on the dark. I don't have to imagine them in watercolor. This evening is its own witness. The birds throw stars on the canvas of the night. They clap into cars and crash through skylights, thunk into steel trash cans with the lids off, slice through the branches of boxed in ginkgos. Gravity snaps shut their wings. The evening's fog smears the city to blinding. Migrating birds, you used to say, the city's light can kill. A sparrow's beak strikes my hand and gashes my palm. I clutch the wound, the meat of my thumb dark with my own blood. You taught me a long time ago to identify the species by the yellow patches around their eyes, their black whiskers, their white throats, and their ivory crowns. You were the one who taught me to imitate their calls. Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. In your career as an ornithologist, you taught me two dozen East Coast bird calls, things I thought you'd always be here to teach me. I reach down to scoop the sparrow from the rooftop with my bloodied hands. He weighs almost nothing. There is so much of you and therefore of myself that I will never know. Tomorrow when the ghost of you enters my window with the smell of rain, I will tell you how, since you died, the birds have never left me. The sparrows are the most recent of a long chain of moments into which the birds, like you, have intruded. The red-tailed hawks perched on the fire escape above Sahadi's awning, or the female barred owl that alights on Borough Hall when I emerge from the subway. For all my prayers the night you died, the divine was nowhere to be found. The 48 white-throated sparrows that plummet from the sky are my only companions in grief tonight. The omen that keeps me from leaning out into the air. This is the first scene. Thank you. It begins so beautifully when I when I got to read that scene again. And you know, I actually remember that the first time when you were nominated for the Lucas Artist Fellowship, we asked you to send in a piece of your writing. And I remember where I was sitting, and this was five years ago. Um, I remember where I was sitting when I first read it. And it only occurred to me later that uh, looking back that, my God, that is this book come to fruition. And it's 
been so beautiful to be part of your life during this journey, during this time that you wrote the map of shells and stars. And also as this book came into being and as, as you kind of groped your way along understanding what it was going to be. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about how this book began and what you thought it might be at the beginning? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, you know, when you like, I think any time that you do anything, right? You look back and you're sort of like, oh, I see how it, one thing logically progressed to another. But at the time, it, it's very much as you described, it felt very much like kind of groping along in the dark. Um, I, I, after, you know, we had talked the other day about this and you had reminded me about that, that I had submitted that uh, with my application. And I, I had thought about it. And I remember now that I'm thinking about it, um, when I sent it off, it felt like a huge risk because I had written it very recently and it was, not the manuscript was nowhere near you know sort of presentable but i felt really strongly that i had the kernel of something um and i remember that first scene uh having this vague sense that i wanted to write about chosen family i wanted to write about um ultimately i think uh, i wanted to write about a character that was struggling with with suicidality frankly and i don't know that i've ever actually talked about that aspect of the book um, but that is a major part of the opening scene, um, is that this character essentially decides not to commit suicide. Um, and I think the way I had been thinking about it at the beginning was, I knew that the character was queer, I knew that there was, there was some gender stuff in the book, but it was very undefined. I was not really out to myself at the time. And it took like many, many rewrites um, to figure out that the character was trans. Um, and and that that was maybe the problem they were had the reason they were having problems connecting to the other characters in the book was like I had to let the character be their full self in a way that I was sort of scared to do on the page for a long time. Um, and you know what I loved about the, the the project of the book and how it evolved was that I wanted to give this character reasons to to live. I wanted this character to find their chosen family and to, to believe that they could find the sacred in themselves, that there were beautiful things about living as a queer person, as a trans person. Um, and that like, it was over all of these many rewrites that I sort of like, with much difficulty, you know, uh, this character sort of found their way. It was like a halting process. It was difficult, but they found their way. And I, I love that about the book, that even the process of writing the book was this sort of like, oh, you wish it could be easy, but not every book is, is, is an easy, uh, like, shot to the end, you know, where you know what's going to happen. <laughs> and the way you begin the book, I, I love, I love the way the birds function in the book, the, the many ways the birds function. Um, and I love the way you begin with the quote from Atar and the way you frame it within the conference of the birds. Would you like to say something about that to kind of frame the importance of that work? And yeah, writing? sure. I mean, so you know, one of the things that I was really, that was important to me from the start uh, when I started conceiving of this book was that I wanted all of this character's identities um, that, you know, in many ways overlap with my own to sort of coexist on the page in the same way that they coexist in our bodies. I mean, I, I think about, you know, how really, like there are some examples, and I think more and more now in publishing, you're seeing this, but I've had very few examples of, let's say, you know, an Arab American person who is queer, who is trans, who is Muslim, um, you know, who's living in diaspora, like all of these things um, obviously coexist in my body and in many other people's bodies, but we don't often get to see them all in one character on the page. Um, and, and like I said, there are other examples, it's not that this is the only one, but I loved, um, being able to do that. And so what I, I ultimately, when I was thinking about this character in search of this mysterious bird linked to his mother, I wanted that search to be linked in a, in a more explicit way to, to the sacred, to the search for the sacred, to wanting to feel, um, to wanting to feel holiness in one's body too, in one's embodiment. Um, and so for me, the conference of the birds was one way to, to do that. Um, and, it, and it's a, a work that means a lot to me also, um, because it's, and in a nutshell, for folks that aren't familiar with it, um, it's essentially uh, an epic Sufi poem um, in which, uh, that's sort of like, a, 
an allegory, if you will, where there's a group of many, many birds that gather together and they are look, they need um, like a leader, a king, they say, we need to go and ch choose a king or find a king. And so um, the hoopo, um, one, this one particular bird says, you know, I know of the Simur and he's a great bird and he can be our king and we should go find him. And the other birds are like, yes, yes, let's go do that. And so they go off on this journey. Um, but then they all sort of start dropping out one by one with all with different excuses. And at the end, only 30 birds arrive at the Simur. And the Simur, um, when, when the Simur opens the door, you realize that it itself is a reflection of the 30 birds that made it. And that in Persian, Simur means 30 birds. And so to me, as I was working with this as a sort of symbol or, or metaphor, extended metaphor in the text, it was really about um, how we are reflections of the divine. And like, that isn't easy. That's not an easy thing for trans people, especially, right? Like we don't often get sort of permission to feel that way. But so I wanted to make it explicit in the text that this was, this character is, um, is searching for that feeling that like even as a trans person that he is a reflection of the divine and the divine is sort of present in his life and in the lives of all the characters. Mm -hmm. And then you give an example or you give a piece of a poem from or a piece of the, the conference of the birds and you quote, if you can contain the whole, why trouble yourself with the parts? Desire all, be all, become all, choose everything, choose everything. And you know, the experience that you describe in the work describes a trajectory, or at least seems to me to describe a trajectory of someone certainly going on a journey of discovery, but also really deeply searching for what embodiment is at all and what it might be to just, to just slough off embodiment completely. And in that way, it, it is so, so in line with what the Conference of the Birds is talking about, that process of leaving the self, leaving the nafs behind and, and journeying toward the beloved, toward the one, uh, and, and, and which is a form of journeying from multiplicity to oneness. And I, I love the way you've said, and I don't know where that quote is exactly right now, but, but your, your narrator says in the book, that it that it's not an end point what I, I wish I had that quote right in front of me now but I just think oh, I wish I could find that too <laughs> yeah here's yeah here it is here it is oh you found it yeah I'm drawn like Layla to observe to find the truth of things but my truth isn't inscribed on my body it lives somewhere deeper somewhere steadier somewhere the body becomes irrelevant Nothing must be changed for this to be true. If I am in a state of becoming, it has no end point. I imagine replacing the memories of everyone I've ever spoken to with the impression that they have only ever seen me as a being clothed in light. I was so moved by that. I mean, there's so, you know, there's, there's like the tremulos of this throughout the work as the narrator is dealing with what, what the body is and what the self is and what the beyond the body and the self is, the much more important, the, the thing that one gets to at the very end when one gets to Mount Kof, the journey's end, really, um, that journey in bodies. Uh, I was so moved by that. How was it that you yourself came to write that? <laughs> as you imagined this story. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, a lot of the time I struggled. I mean, when I was writing the text, I struggled with language a lot for several reasons. And sometimes I got around this with metaphor and sometimes I got around it with art. And I think that's one of the reasons why I started to pull in um, visual art from a really early point in, in, in drafting the book. Um, because it's a way of getting around language. Mm. But um, mostly, you know, for one thing, I didn't want to use, I didn't want to use language as a shortcut, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
for one thing, because language in terms of like identity that, that are more like label it, labels, which is, there's nothing wrong with labels, but to say, oh, this character is non-binary or, oh, this character is X, Y, Z, whatever you will, you know, they might, however they might label themselves, um, wasn't useful to me, or maybe it didn't feel useful to me, not because it wasn't true. I mean, the character is canonically non-binary, um, transmasculine, but at the same time, like those words don't actually appear in the novel in relation to the narrator themselves. Um, himself, he uses he, him pronouns. Um, but also because when I was, I mean, even for how I sort of became aware of my own gender and needs around embodiment, like language didn't help me. And I don't know that it helps, maybe I'm sure that it does help people. And language, we were talking about this the other day, language has huge implications for our embodiment. It makes it possible in many cases, especially when it comes to talking with gatekeepers. But that doesn't actually, it doesn't necessarily capture what it feels like to exist, not just in a trans body, but like to have a soul to to have any soul at all not just a trans soul but like to what is existence how do we know anything about ourselves language isn't necessarily helpful there and so like for me a lot of the experience of what it means to be trans is not at all about having language with using language with myself to say like well i want to look like this or feel like this or whatever um in any kind of way that uh is communicable to most of society it's more it's more been a journey at least for me of just trying to get closer and closer to this felt sense let's say that lies behind the body almost exactly the way that i said it on the page where it doesn't the body is actually irrelevant it actually doesn't matter at all it's sort of secondary that anything that you do to bring the body in line with the soul really is secondary to actually just having an understanding of of who you are. Um, and I'm not talking about like gender and who's like, oh, you know, I'm going to label my gender in this way or that way. But I just mean as a human being, like as, as, a, as, a, as a created being. Um, mm -hmm. And so that like lack of language for that um, was kind of the point in a lot of the text. It was like, I, I, not just that language is insufficient, but I actively wanted to move away from language because I think that that's really the only way to sufficiently communicate the feeling of, um, of, of that, that sort of thing that for me, at least in my transition, but not just in my transition, but in my life has sort of kept me moving toward myself. And I suspect that the thing that I'm moving toward is not just sort of myself, um, but something much bigger than me, something, something that, um, that is accessible to all of us, but that we don't necessarily pay attention to all the time. Um, and I'm now I'm getting a little bit esoteric, so I should probably stop. But <laughs> That's my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple other things that you said around this, which is so beautiful. I spent the rainless evening standing in fields at sunset, waiting to be raptured into the green flash of twilight, wishing there were another way to exist in the world to, than to be bodied. And then, and then your narrator says, and I'm flooded with the urge to return my body and slip myself into different softness, the stems of orchids maybe, the line of sap running up the trunk of a maple, the fist of a fox's heart. Yeah, I'm, that's me just trying to communicate that very, you know, sort of odd mouthful of things that I was just trying to talk about. And I don't know, you know, sometimes the only way you can do it is with image because it conveys a felt sense much more effectively. And maybe that's why the character is a blocked artist, <laughs> you know? You know, as I, as I look at the narrative, um, and I see these different threads that are running through it. There's the, the narrative. Uh, um, so you, what you have is a, is a frame tale of, of like a present with one narrator. And then you have a woven in, um, for those who haven't read the book yet, um, a, a woven in story. And I, I, I want to be careful not to do any spoilers. So I'm going to try to be careful. Um, a woven in story, another, uh, an earlier family in the 30s coming from Syria to New York. And, uh, and the surprises as those thread, those braids come together. And 
there's, you know, there's, there's two human storylines, the story of Nadir, your, your, your narrator, uh, well, one of your narrators, your frame narrator, and, and of Layla, of, of the other, and, and, and the way there's a braided, but then there's also, in a way, two stories of the birds. So there's two bird stories, in a, in a, two bird lines of story. One is the, the bird migrations that are coming. They're just constantly flitting through the text. I mean, they're coming through. I mean, they're flitting through and then they're coming and then they're raining down and then, then they're coming through a character's heart. And it's this beautiful moving painting of birds. Um, it is just, it's like music, uh, the way you use them. Uh, and then of course, behind it is this melody, this, this through line of the story of the Seymour, which you, you start, of what those journeys might mean, um, the journey behind all journeys. And I think that's so beautiful. And the, uh, mm, mm. I wish yeah, there were more- Yeah, talk about like, the birds a little bit? <laughs> yeah, tell about the birds. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, actually I think that in a way, one thing that occurs to me is that in a way like, um, that search for the Seymour in a, in a sort of metaphorical way and then the search for the, the mysterious bird that sort of reflects that um, in a more sort of literal plot way um, is it definitely, uh, I think it speaks to something about what we were talking about earlier um, in terms of like transness as movement toward some um, some, I suppose, more pure um, or more just uh, different imagining, like uh, of, of what of, of possibility, maybe um, like moving toward possibility. Um, that you know, we are sort of there's like the, the infinite reaching. I mean, I don't know. I think that's just my maybe idea of what it means to be trans. That there's like a way in which we embrace. Um, that reaching and and understanding that like maybe we'll never actually arrive and that, that that's okay that we don't have to arrive that I think is very in line with um the conference of the birds with with the yearning for the beloved in you know um also potentially in like uh, a, a faith sense which is why I love that this character gets to be queer and trans and Muslim on the page um mm -hmm. And, you know, also for me, like the, the sort of, uh, when I started to think about the birds um, in the other, you say, you described it really well, it's like that there's the other thread of the birds that are sort of like flooding New York City. Um, the way that I was thinking about it as I was writing was that there are all of these violences, large and small violences um, in New York City that the, the narrator kind of talks about, now that talks about as he's in the process of looking for this bird and choosing his name. Um, including, you know, just the, the settling of New York City itself on indigenous land, the genocide of indigenous peoples, violence, police violence, um, specifically mentioned police violence against black people in the city, violence against trans people, um, just so many violence against uh, Islamophobic violence, which is on, on the page in a different way because Nadir's, in a more literal way, because Nadir's mother was killed five years before the book begins in an Islamophobic hate crime. And so there's this awareness that there's all these violences. Um, and that I had imagined that the birds entering the city um, and sort of crescendoing as the book goes on, it's almost like they are the white blood cells of the body that are sort of flooding toward the wound, um, that the natural world is actually responding to these human violences. Um, and in a way that is unstoppable, overwhelming and sort of um, unexplainable that like people don't necessarily understand what's happening. They don't know, they don't have language for that either, you know? Mm. Uh, so I liked that sense that like, um, the city is very much alive and, and that it remembers and that the land itself remembers. Mm. And I love the way you bring memory into the book. And, and this, there's many magical things happening in this book, but, but from what the birds are doing, but also this character has a way of knowing. And there's this beautiful line um, that in which the character, well, here it is. I'm addicted to the memories that live on in the mind of New York. 
the flood that comes when I place my hand on a wall or a window or a stoop, the knowledge that death and time are both illusions because we and every stone are made of the same ever shifting particles. If we live, it's only because some distant galaxy lent us its dust for a while. And then Nadir goes on to say, when he puts his hand on, on, on a building, he can feel the people there before. What a beautiful passage that is. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was worried it when I was writing this that I was like, oh, am I going overboard a little bit with, you know, that there's this magical realism. And, but then I was like, you know what, I'm not, I'm not convinced actually that's, that, um, that that piece and especially the piece just about his ongoing relationship with his mother, who is a ghost, who is a character in the book. I'm not sure that those things are really magical realism. Um, just because I, I know so, I mean, for myself and I know so many people that I'm close to that like have ongoing relationships with the dead, um, you know, with loved ones that have passed on that, that those, that those relationships can be evolving and changing well after death that, you know, people will come back and visit and will communicate with us in so many ways. And maybe that's a cultural thing partially. I mean, I think that a lot of, um, you know, other, other Arabs, other Muslims, but like many other people, you know, around the world have beliefs about this. And so I think there's, you know, I think sometimes um, in general, like in, let's say, sort of dominant American society, there can be like a dismissal of some of that, right? Relationships with the dead, especially and with the past that um, I'm not sure is really true to reality. Like, I do think that a lot of those things are still present for us, you know, and that our ancestors are still present with us in a lot of ways. And the way you bring in in the book, the ancestors being present and those stories being present. And, and you actually say at one point, the strange feeling that the past is not so far away, that things that happened a long time ago are in some corner of my mind still happening. And you give us that feeling in the texture of the book and the layering of it. I mean, I, 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 you know, there were times when I had to stop and think, no, when am I, you know, I, I got myself into a long forever and I, and, and which layer of the braided realities am I on? And I sometimes, I, you know, I really feel that if we as humans were able to sense time in the way time really is, we would know that that is actually all around us in exactly the way you de depict it with Nadir putting his hand on the building. All of it is happening in layers right now, but we are writing time as though it's linear and we can't feel it. Um, but you, you bring that across in, in a way that's very beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I very much agree with you. And I'm glad that came across. I think that I do that a lot in my, I did that in MAP too, in a way, I, you know, where I was layering up a story that took place in the past with one that's in the present and that, that these things be, begin to sort of like blend together in a way where you're like, well, I'm not, which story am I actually, does this belong to in a way and that is like, fine. exactly, that's the point. Every other story, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, so then, okay, there's something I wanted to say. Ah. Oh, did you need to read the piece about the ancestors? Yeah, let me, or yeah. Yeah, let me say, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, then you, the way you lead into these stories. So, so you're also talking about elders and these stories of elders that because of the, the worlds that they lived in had to be occluded, that could not be seen, could not be spoken of, couldn't make, and, and you made visible some of these kinds of stories that would have been there all along. And uh, I'd love if you could read the piece about um, Teta who is the aunt yes. of Absolutely, yeah. Um, so this one, so page 158, um, I don't know if anyone's reading along, but if you are, it's page 158. Um, this is about um, Nadir Steta, his grandmother, and, and what he knows about her, let's say. Teta doesn't like to tell stories quite the way they happened. If I'm lucky, I'll catch her in an unguarded moment when she's willing to tell me the story the way it felt to her, or to tell me a fable instead of an event. I never imagined that I could know someone so well and yet know so little about them. You used to tell me about growing up with Teta, about when she was young, but by the time you died, there were still so many things I wasn't ready to hear. Until Rima arrived here, Teta was all I had left. It sometimes feels as though she holds universes of history that I will never be allowed to know, as though it's improper for us to ever really know each other. 
and sometimes our silences are more than I can stand. Reem gets up and goes into the kitchen to start dinner. I sit down on the couch beside Teta. You, told, you never told me you had a baby brother, I say. Habibti, he was go gone before he was here. What is done is buried. Teta shifts her weight in her chair and I lean over to adjust the heating pad at her back. She turns her face to the window where the owl waits. It would be easy to fall back into our usual pattern, stirring a cup of tea or chuckling at Esmahan, the cat, <laughs> licking the water from the rim of a plastic cup, letting the drone of the television put us to sleep. But when my gaze drifts to the shoe boxes lining the walls of Teta's room, I think of the robin's eggs and wonder what hidden things Teta has been telling me all along that I've never bothered to hear. And the story brings um, this forward in ways I won't say, uh, but we discover- I know, I'm trying not to spoil. Uh, yeah, spoiler, <laughs> uh, but we discover, I mean, so it, you know, it, we discover, we get an ability to look back through history and see those lives that we're not, spoke, that we're not told about in, in the public discourse and the, in the, you know, and uh, you said, you told me a little bit about some research you've been doing in an archive. Yeah, um, so when I was in, this was in 2019 when I was working on a revision, one of many revisions of this book, uh, I was an artist in residence at the Arab American National Museum um, in, in Dearborn, so outside of Detroit. And I, I got, I, I feel really lucky that I was able to have access to their oral history archives, among others. I mean, they have really extensive archives um, from various Arab American communities. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was in the oral history archives, one of the things that happened to me was that I, I had the chance to, as I was listening, there were recordings from um, women auto workers in Detroit over the last, you know, many, many decades. Some of them are, are fairly old, actually, um, uh, the, uh, the recordings. And one of the recordings I remember, you know, listening to the person's voice and, and just like their, the cadence of the way they were talking. And I had this moment of recognition where I was like, that voice sounds very much like the, how queer women that I know speak. Um, and, you know, I don't know anything about that person in the recording, but it was just a moment of like, well, even if that person wasn't queer, like there surely were um, many queer people in that community. And the other thing that I think about a lot is, um, you know, I did a lot of reading of like academic sources too, and a lot of scholarship um, around the archives. And um, one person, I actually had, had the opportunity to talk um, to her, uh, to this, this um, researcher and professor, Charlotte uh, Karim Albrecht, and uh, she's at the University of Michigan. We had an event last week and she was telling me about her research. Um, she's written a lot about photographs in the archives. And we had this great conversation about how a lot of these photographs that were taken of Arab Americans were sort of posed very specifically to achieve certain ends, specifically about assimilation and proving Americanness, being as close to American whiteness as possible in order to have rights really, and to have, um, to not be harassed, to have people's respect, to be able to just live their lives, um, portraying them as like productive workers, you know, with family businesses and being as heteronormative as possible, having a nuclear family, not having like all of the extended family around all the time, which was very common. Um, for 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 Arabs in general, like for people who were coming over from um, from the Levant, that would have been very common. But you couldn't necessarily show that in the archive and in these photographs. But if you look closely, a lot of relationships are preserved that we may not understand. Like they might not be written down this way, but that like you will find photographs of you know two women together or two men together, and it'll just say like friends, you know. But they'll, but they, you can see that perhaps, I mean, it's possible that there was more to it. And you know that those relationships existed, whether in, you know, the community in little Syria, let's say, or whether it was on the road when they were traveling, um, you know, on these trips that they would, folks would make, especially in the 20s and the 30s and before that even, um, to, to sell things, to, to make a little bit of money. Um, this is very common for Syrian Americans, especially. Um, that like there was a lot of, of ways of, of relating to each other, of socializing on the road and at home that didn't fall into this sort of, um, you know, acceptable heteronormative way of relating. 
and that that doesn't make those relationships not exist. It doesn't, um, you know, we may not, they may not have ever been labeled, but they surely existed and that there are evidences of them. It's just that, you know, some of them may have either been actively hidden in terms of like not written down or not conveyed, but also some of it is just people considering what is private versus public information too, you know? And so that's, I think also where like those erasures in the text come in is like, sometimes the only power that you have to take back the control of your narrative is to leave things out. Mm. And that leads me to think about legibility. Uh, legibility, like being able to be understood and read or, un or, and there's uh, several things that I, that you wrote here. Um, you wrote at one point in the book, I can imagine that we make a strange pair, but it's the way they glare at me that makes me pause as though I'm rude for appearing this way with my square jaw and unreadable face in a space where they had expected someone legible. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I thought about legibility in the ways you, you talked about it. I, I, I found myself picking out passages that struck me and, and bringing them, kind of reading them against each other. Um, and then later you wrote this, maybe this is why I don't want to make myself legible. I want to erase the meanings that have been ascribed to my breath, to my sweat, to my hair and fat and skin. I trace the green veins in my neck that branch down into my breasts as feathers. I am painting myself as the bird that to the world outside this room does not exist. I draw myself clothed in wings and tell myself that even the angels are sexless. That is so beautiful, Zane. Thank uh, you. And then you said things about words and it made me realize that legibility and words are actually a completely different thing. You know, we think of these things as the same, words and legibility, but no, actually those are distinct. Uh, mm. Can you talk about that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think what I was trying to, some of what I was trying to get at was just that, um, how do I say this? That like, one, the body can exist beyond language, you know, and embodiment can exist beyond language. What is within the body or contained by the body can exist beyond language and does to a great extent exist beyond language, even though we give it language. Um, but that like language is something that is sort of applied to, to things and it's often inadequate, one. Um, it's sort of an approximation of, of the things that we can see. And so like, mostly in life, I think, you know, especially, let's say, especially for cis people, um, there is this sort of assumption that things are, and especially bodies are easily labeled and, and they're immediately visible, you know, and like, oh, I know how to label this person and this person or this body or that body or whatever. And so um, there is a thing that happens where, uh, you know, I mean, I think this is, this is hyper visibility occurs in this way that when, when one exists in public um, in a way that is not immediately legible as a thing that cisnormative society understands how to name or label can't and can't read um, uh, in in the terms that they are uh, that they want to read a, a person in, um, it's very it's often very dangerous uh, that there's like a real. Um, that there are real material consequences for that and real potential for violence attached to that. And so, um, you know, I think part of the reason that there is so much danger in that for trans people is that we deconstruct not in any sort of like, we don't need to use language to do this, but our, our existence in public space deconstructs the link between um, language and legibility, if you will. Uh, that's one way of thinking about it, I think that it's sort of like, these things don't necessarily go together, that we don't, you don't necessarily, that language doesn't necessarily actually inherently describe a reality um, that there's, or that there's maybe more, um, either there's more nuance or that like, it's the reality of, of what is possible is much, much greater than what we have language for. And I think that that does disturb people that aren't ready to see that, you know, because it is something that happens on a non-language level when someone is is seen, but not necessarily read in the way that is expected. 
and it's interesting actually to watch how deeply disturbed people can be about their preconceived notions of what is stable being and 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 and, and the level of in, in danger actually that could come up that people don't um it, it really shows how deeply ingrained humans notions of things that the you know the gender is binary and uh, when that gets shaken up uh things happen yeah. I think that's a lot of the reason for so much of the um, backlash against trans people is this uh, reluctance to actually acknowledge that, um, you know, that that reality, that 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 humanity is this um, like vast maybe impossibility of, of like how we of the range of ways that we exist, um, and that. Uh, that, that can disturb some people. Um, and so there's this need for all of this sort of like rhetoric uh, to, to rewrite that and to, to sort of misdirect away from that when in reality, it's just that we're just trying to like live our lives and walk down the street. <laughs> yeah, and something that makes me, um, I think about in your work and we're about to have Kelly and Donna come back in for questions, but is, is emergence, um, the state of emergence. And I think you experienced this while writing this book the, bur the book, no one knew what the book would, would be, least of all you. The book didn't even know what it would be, right? It was <laughs> itself as it flew itself, right? Like, a, you know, we're building this plane while we fly it. Um, I watched you do it. Uh, and it, it was a beautiful thing, you know, and, and it brings up the question of emergence. How does one construct? a self when there is not language for this yet, when one is actually on the bleeding edge of what is able to be talked about, of what we know we can talk about. Um, so much of this is happening in that space. Um, there's this beautiful uh, thing you wrote here and you've also written for uh, uh, something will come up someday in the LAP book that you, I reimagine myself as my first work um, the artist's first job is to make himself. Mm, yeah. And that yeah, says that. Well, yeah. It was an emergent text for so long in so many ways, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To not know what it was going to be. I mean, that's, you know, may we all have the strength to wade out into that marsh. Hmm. Is to not know. I mean, maybe we all are waiting out into that marsh. That's what life is in, as an embodied human. We do not know. We wait into time without knowing when time will end for us. And it's we're, we're all in a long middle um, on on this long journey of on the way to Mount, Mount Kaf, wh whether we know we're going there or not, <laughs> dragging the nuffs behind us, you know, the self behind us. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agreed. Kelly and Donna. Yeah, I think that's what I. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that I think that that's like one of the things that I love most about this book is that so many of the experiences that Nadar has are not at all inherently trans experiences. Like mm -hmm. Nadar has a human experience, and um, I mean, I kind of hope that like that cis people reading this will also be like, oh wow, but like that's a you know I can relate to this and I can relate to this. And it's like, well, yes, because like to be trans is just maybe maybe in some ways you have to get more in touch with certain aspects of the self and just be more real about like well i can't i can't do this or i can't conform to this but ultimately like we're all just here having human experiences <laughs> of existing and having bodies you know and making it up as we go along yeah it's the including the self making the self up as we go along and that, you know, or maybe finding the self, you know, yeah. that it's like, we like to think that we're very fixed beings and that things are clear all the time. And I don't think that they are. I think things are unclear more often than we'd like to admit, you know? Hello, Kelly and Donna. I see Hello. you back. I know Donna agrees with me that we could just sit and listen for a while longer. <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, thank you very much, both of you and Lori, for you just being who you are, so thoughtful. I love this kind of the long forever 
and this mm -hmm. idea of language and language, you know, we're kind of at this moment. And I think part of Scratch Base is this kind of rad radical imagining and we're outgrowing our language. We don't have words for kind of who we're becoming, right? And if we really want to upend this kind of white supremacy basis that we're all living within, we need new language. Um, this was beautiful. Donna, I think you have a question. Well, I just also like to echo Kelly's comments and thank you both for like a beautiful and inspiring conversation. It's given yeah. us so much to think about and just, it was just very, a delight to witness the exchange and you can see that it's kind of rooted in this very deep and long conversation that you've been having for a long period of time about Zane's work and ideas and so thank you for sharing. Um, I, I, you talked, Zane, about this idea of, you know, censoring as resistance and you talked about um, as a kind of way to take back control of the narrative to determine what's private versus what's public. But I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that and also this kind of integration of that as a visual element in the book. Yeah. Uh, a little bit more about that if you didn't mind. Yeah, sure. I mean, so it started as a way to get around or uh, maybe address something that uh, has been a convention in in let's say in prose written about trans people or trans characters for a long time, which is that um, readers often, cis readers often expect to see a character's dead name. They expect, um, you know, there's sort of precedent, let's say, not all books are like this obviously, and more and more they're not, as trans writers are, are gaining the ability to tell our own stories. But there were for a long time, they would sort of treat transness as a sort of like a surprise reveal or like you couldn't like a spoiler, like you couldn't include that. And I was obviously I was very against this um, and it's gross. But, um, you know, then I started to think like, well, wow, I have these strong feelings about this. And I kind of want to address that with the reader in a way that has the immediacy of what it actually feels like as a trans person to see that on the page, to see a character's dead name on the page or to have gender relate, you know, relate as a spoiler. Um, and so the best way I could think to do that was, I know the cis reader is going to expect and want the dead name of this character. They're going to be uncomfortable with the fact that the character is not named at all for like three quarters of the book. And I actually want to draw attention to that. And how do I do that? I just put a scribble mm -hmm. just so that they would be like, oh, you're not giving it to me. And it's like, no, I'm not giving it to you. The, the character is not giving it to you. And then as I started doing that, I realized, well, you know, I can do the same thing in a sort of mirrored way in the, the diary of Leila Z, who is the historical character in the other thread we were talking about, um, that she actually, and here's what it, I can show you what it looks like, that she actually in her journal, you know, of which we're reading pieces, actually just does, you know, that um, on the page. I mean, which is, you know, I like scribbled out by hand um, on my partner's uh, parking ticket at one point, by the way, as an aside, I did not know that that's what it was. And I got all excited. Oh, look, I finally figured it out. And Mateo goes, oh, I have to pay that. <laughs> but it's okay, we, we got through it. <laughs> um. That's, that's so interesting. Uh, well, in relation to that, can you tell us a little bit about the cover of the book and the image? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, so this is, um, well, I can show you the final. That's an arc that I'm reading from, but this is the final. Um, so the cover designer is Lewan Kwan, who is amazing. I, you know, to be honest, like, I don't necessarily, I don't know where the image, like, it, the specific image is taken from, but the symbolism is, it is related to a particular let's say disembodied wing that is uh, mm. that lives through the story uh which i love and also i love that my publisher um as with map of salt and stars by the way mm. managed to incorporate the arabic translation of the title um onto mm. the spine mm. yeah yeah it's my layla the 30 names of night um i love that that can be on there 
Um, I mean, I just love the fact that it's like a story about a Syrian American person who is trans and there's like Arabic on the cover and in something about, it's a book that takes place in New York City mostly. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I love that. So yeah, I love the cover. Yeah, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. It's that conference of the birds, right? It's the many parts being the whole, it's really, you did it. Say hey, Alex Christie joined us today. And Alex said, Hi, Hi Alex. Hey. Alex. Yay. She sent a question that says, thanks so much for absorb for the conversation. How do you hold ordinary language at bay while seeking a new way of speaking? And what's the attitude? Is it patience until something new is revealed? That's such a good question. Um oh it's from Alex. Yeah. Well, Alex, we knew Alex was going to ask a good question. Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, I think the best way I can answer it is just that like, well, on the one hand, I think it's something that I had to do like again and again, like there were, there was a lot of sort of repeated drafting, like I say revising, but it's really like I just wrote this book over and over and over again in different forms. Like it just, and every time I would write it, it would change and it would, things would shift around and language would shift around. And there were a lot of times when I was just like, I don't know if I'm ever gonna finish this book. Um, I really didn't, I, up until maybe the last draft, I was like, I don't, I don't know. And like, that's, I'm sorry to my editor. <laughs> like we got it, it's done now. So don't be afraid. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, it was scary because it was kind of like, I, there are times where you're just like, I don't know if I can say this. I, I don't know how to say it. And so I think partially it's like saying it over and over again until you say the thing that is true. Um, and then partially I think that I, that there was a lot of just like not saying anything, that there was like a lot of silence um, and me having to go back and sit with myself and be like, I, I actually, I'm trying to write about something I don't fully understand even about myself and my own like existence and embodiment. And uh, to be, to like sort of wait in those places where there isn't any language until something emerges, even if it's very, very small and then just sort of hold on for dear life to any little tiny fragment that you can pull out of that. I mean, that, that sounds extreme, but that really is kind of how it felt that I was just sort of holding on as hard as I possibly could to the very few things that felt real. And that every time I would rewrite the book, I would start with just those and, and then replace everything else. <laughs> Not a great, you know, experience, but that's the truth. <laughs> but I think so many people thank you for, for going through it, for what Alex calls a wild ride. I mean, you know, yeah. we need your voice <laughs> at this time. And you know, you're building words, you're building pathways for the new generation as you do this, as you create words, you know, you're, 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 you're cutting through a thicket, you're making pathways, yep. other paths that, that others will have an easier time following. You're just, you're, so. the, you're the cutter through, you know, that that part's not <laughs> easy. I hope yeah. so. I feel that the coming, the generation that's coming up after me actually has done a lot of cutting through for me, to be fair. Um, I mean, <laughs> I mean, like Generation Z people watching this, like, no, really. I mean, I think that uh, Matteo says something, there's a saying in Italian actually, that's like the younger generation is going to eat on all of our heads. And I kind of love that. <laughs> <laughs> like they're, they're gonna run circles around us is probably the closest translation, but they're going to eat on our heads because they're, they are free to like move and, and exist and sort of like let go of things and, and take hold of other things in a way that like maybe we all could have been or could be free in those ways, but that we have not allowed ourselves to be maybe. Um, and the like, I've learned a lot from watching, you know, people that are in their teens and twenties that are dealing with these things with a lot less shame, with a lot less sort of rigidity, I think, than people in my generation, people in generations before me have done. And I'm grateful for it. Like, I'm very here for it, so. It's interdependent though. I mean, I think it's a generation like Lori Sid that's also looking to you, you know, to people to everybody who's kind of looking to find their voice and they're watching that struggle and they're saying, wait just a minute, you know, we don't have this, this stuff doesn't matter anymore. So 
you know, it's a kind of mutual inspiration and, and support um, for a new kind of voice. Mm. It keeps us honest, maybe, you know, knowing yeah. that like we have a responsibility to the people that came before us and we owe them so much. And we also have a responsibility to the people that are coming up after us. I try to remind myself of that a lot. Yeah. And, and to the, to the conversation and, and talking about the ancestors and the ancestors keep coming up, you know, and that idea of also being beholden to our ancestors and, and taking them with us, you know, yeah. pulling them in closer. And that feels like something that's new to us again, like made new again for many of us at this time. This was terrific. Can I ask a quick other question? <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if you can tell us, saying, um, you know, what other projects you have coming up? And oh, yeah. Started sure. writing anything new? <laughs> I am. I can't speak much about it, unfortunately. Things are like in very early stages, but I'm working on several book length projects. Um, and this Saturday, I'm actually teaching a, um, a writing class. I don't know if nice. any folks are interested out there. We have a few slots left. It's I'm teaching about structure and creative nonfiction. Um, so if anyone's like working on personal essay um, or, you know, like memoir and things like that, um, definitely come join us. It's gonna be a good time, four hours on Saturday afternoon. And uh, yeah, I'm so grateful for this space that we got to share together. I'm so grateful <laughs> for all of you, Lori. It's always good. We could talk for like, that because four hours on Saturday could just be us talking. <laughs> now all we need is artist dinner to be served. That's that exactly what I'm thinking. Now it's time for us to sit down and share a meal together. I wish. <laughs> Until soon. We miss you all. Um, oh, miss you too. Thank you for this time. Thank you for late nights and being with us. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. Miss you all very, very much. It's great. Donna, will you tell us about next week? on Scratch Face or not next week, but the 22nd of April. Yes, I'd be very delighted to. So on April the 22nd, we're going to be joined by Bettina Fraget, who is the program director for the SETI Institute's Artist in Residency program. Zin Lu, an artist and engineer who is currently the artist curator in Space Exploration Initiative in MIT's Media Lab and also the SETI Artist in Residence, as well as Kimberly Warren Rhodes, who is a research scientist at NASA and the SETI Institute, specializing in planetary, desert ecology, and astrobiology. Ooh, I'm um, coming to that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Um, so we're going to be talking about what astrobiology can tell us about life here and on other planets and what it can tell us about how we can navigate our sustainability crisis. We'll be talking with Zin about... Um, her collaborative project, Unearthing Futures, which uh, seeks to decolonialize narratives of planetary futures through growing, shaping, and sharing potatoes from seeds that travel to the International Space Station. So it's going to be interesting. So please, we hope you can join us then. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you having so us. Much. Thank you for giving such a beautiful book to the world. No oh, kidding. Thank you. thank you. Okay. Until soon, Love to we'll you all. dinner in the sky. Yay. <laughs> dinner in the sky. <laughs> <laughs>